All right, welcome to TRC Tech Talks. Today we'll be talking about Stratix 5700 Express setup and smart port configuration. So this meeting is being recorded. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat or the Q&A. I am Joe Belaski, one of the presenters today. With me is Brandon Singh and Mike Masterson. We're all uh, automation specialists for the Reynolds company. And we also have uh, Brian and Wayne as well to answer questions. We have upcoming topics. So users group, our monthly uh, long event is uh, coming up on August 30, August 21st, talking about scale, scalable compute in the edge gateway. We also have a few tech talks coming up on the 30th. We have in-hand networks talking about cellular routers. And on August 4th, we have Rockwell cloud-based infrastructure and that it talks a little bit about cloud computing. So it'd be a good one to attend. All of them are good ones to attend. The users group typically runs about twice to three times as long as a standard tech talk, a little more in depth. So today we're gonna to be talking about express setup and configuring switches. The reason that we're talking about this is uh, say a, more more uh, customers than I'd like to than I'd like to know uh, actually don't configure their switches. They buy managed switches and don't go through the process of doing any configuration to them at all, which doesn't turn on any of the functionality that these switches have. And some stuff is on by default out of the box, but without any configuration, it doesn't really know what to prioritize and what to do. So we're going to be talking about that and Rockwell has made this fairly simple when it comes to their Stratix switches. So we'll be running through Express Setup and the Smart Port functionality, which allows you to use a drop down to select what the switch configurations and port configurations are. So Express Setup, to activate that and you power up your switch, wait for it to stabilize. So sometimes up to, well, for the old ones, maybe up to two plus minutes. And while it does all of its self tests, and once it's complete, you use a paper clip to press the express setup button. Now you wanna do a quick press of that. And when you do that, one of the lights will start to flash. And typically it'll be on one of the open ports. And that will basically allow the switch to uh, turn on DHCP for that port and it will assign you an IP address on your laptop. So key thing there, we're, I know that most of us on the phone play with automation stuff all the time and we're constantly assigning static IP addresses and DH and back and forth depending on what we're plugging into. And in this case, you wanna make sure you have DHCP enabled on your laptop so that you can plug into it. It will assign you an IP address and you will be able to connect. So, and typically this is gonna be port one, the one that I'm, I got Daryl pointing to. It isn't always port one. Sometimes it is a, a different port, depending on what ports are utilized at the time. So if you have a switch that's already in use or has a bunch of stuff in it, you may end up on port 16 if that's the only open port. So the next part I actually took out of the manual. Uh, Basically what you'll do is navigate to the IP address 169254.0.1. And you can do that in pretty much any browser. I think I've done it in almost all of them that I have on my computer at this point and haven't had really any issues. And then you will want to enter the default username and password, which is admin and switch, all lowercase. That is also published in our manual. So, one of the reasons you want to do this as well is so that you can change those passwords for security purposes. 
So once you've completed that step, it'll let you in and you'll end up at the, this screen and you'll want to fill in these parts. So you'll want to give it a host name. So it will require that. So you can't just leave it blank. You have to assign it some sort of name that means something to you. And then for most of our customers, they'll just set an IP address, which will be the address of the switch itself, a default gateway. In some cases, you don't set a default gateway if you don't really need one, but most people set one anyways, just in case they'll need one in the future. And then you'll need to change the password. So you'll have to set a new password. Now, while you're on this page, there's also some more advanced stuff you can do with changing management VLANs, and there's also an advanced tab below. But for now, for most cases, this is going to cover what you need to do. Once you hit OK, you'll end up at this screen as it refreshes. And this is the status screen for the 5700. The status screen basically gives you information on all the individual ports, information about the switch, the firmware, the utilization, and you can do a little bit of additional dive in there. It also replicates all of the indicators. Now in this case, since we're doing express setup, you're probably sitting very close to the switch anyways. But in the case you want to look at the switch after the fact, typing in the IP address of it and logging in, you can see all the information that, that it has so it can stay locked in its panel. So the next step is going to be setting up smart ports. So when you hit configuration, you get this list of all of the different configuration functions that exist within, these, within the GUI. And one thing to keep in mind is these are Cisco switches underneath the hood and still can use CLI and other, other configuration functions as well. So there's more that they can do outside of this, but this is a majority of the functions that we set them to do. So I'm just gonna run through this list real quick of the different pieces. So smart ports, configures individual ports for what you want them to do. We're gonna get into that on the next slide. The global macros is a more advanced function. Uh, port settings basically is gonna be setting your configuration of the port for speed and full duplex, things like that, or turning a port off. Port thresholds, is actually a very useful function which allows you to limit how many packets can come in in a certain amount of time, typically one second, on a port to prevent packet storms, things like that, in case somebody creates a, a loop that isn't supposed to be there, you know, a ring that isn't a DLR ring. You also have uh, Ether Channels, which is going to be setting your uplinks to uh, go to switches and having them work together. Uh, DHCP is a very important one that we use a lot in reference. That one allows us to assign addresses per port to an individual device. So you can replace a device in the future and not have any uh, time having to configure that device with an IP address, this which will force it into it. Um, VLAN management is very important as we do a lot of different virtual LAN systems. So that allows us to break individual ports off into basically break the switch into two different pieces or three or four different pieces so that individual ports can only talk to certain other ports. So we use that a lot in large network applications. Uh, let's get power management. Uh, PTP, precision time protocol. If you're using SIP sync or any of those functionalities, it's important to go in there and configure that to either be a transparent or a boundary clock and setting it up depending on what you're trying to do. NTP network time protocol, setting it up so the switch knows what time it is. And then advanced functions like routing are also in there. So we can also do some of the DLR rep functionality and we can also get into security for network address translation, uh, port security, IGMP snooping, which basically is used for doing uh, multicast management. And so there's a, a bunch of other functionality in here that we don't typically get into when we're doing a base switch configuration. All of these functions exist for a specific purpose and sometimes you need to turn them on.
So this is where you go in to adjust those. So once you select smart ports, you'll end up at this screen where you'll have all of the ports and you can assign a role to them. So you can either use the uh, little radial buttons there to select multiple ports at once and edit all of them. Or you can edit any individual port just by selecting underneath role where it said none. And there's a drop down list of all of the different combinations or different, excuse me, uh, roles as you can assign. So a majority of these roles are at, to an extent fairly self-explanatory. The I do have a list on the next page where we'll go into them a little bit deeper. The one main thing to look at is you want to make sure you assign something. So the, the, the real purpose behind these is so that the switch knows what to do. And if you set it up for a automation device, basically what that does is it knows the switch now knows what to expect on the other end. And when you do that, and the if you've ever played with one of these switches in the past and you plug something into it, sometimes the light will flash yellow for up to 30 seconds as it tries to figure out what the device is. And then it'll fl start flashing green and allow you to actually communicate. And that delay is detrimental in certain automation systems, especially on a little power blip or something like that. And so by going in here and setting the smart port functionality, the switch will automatically start allowing communication as soon as the network's plugged in, as soon as the cable's plugged in. So that's very useful for reducing a 30 second downtime due to a power blip or somebody unplugging a cable and plugging it back in. You know, there, there isn't an additional 30 second delay. So very useful, especially if you're doing something like flashing firmware of other field devices or something like that, where they are constantly rebooting. I know in the case of flashing firmware in an E300, they uh, power cycle themselves about five, six times during that process. And by not having a smart port functionality or a role set, you basically add an additional almost three minutes to the firmware flash time, just waiting on the, the port to start to allow communication. So it's very important to set these roles. So the typical roles, so there is a, a list here of all of the different roles that you can choose. And automation device is the most common one. And then there's also the multi-port automation device is the one that for the most part I typically use for a lot of the different things. And the key thing there is the automation device only supports one MAC ad address, MAC ID. So if you plug in two devices to that port, it will only communicate to one of them. It will block the second one out. And so that's very important, especially if you set them all by default to automation device and then plug your laptop in and you're running a virtual machine. Now that you can't get an IP address for your virtual machine, it'll block you out. So it's very important to make sure that you set the appropriate role. Now it's also very good for security purposes if you're doing a single device to set it to automation device and you don't have to worry about somebody piggybacking in off the other port if there's one available. Now multi-port automation device allows for linear topologies and things like that, so very, very useful. And then desktop for automation and virtual desktop for automation. Again, that is a differentiation between Mac IDs one Mac or two. And then you have a functionality for router for automation, phone for automation, wireless for automation. And we'll go back to the phone for automation. One of the reasons that that is in this list is the priority. So one of the main things that we're doing with this is also setting priority of communication. And typically when we're doing a automation device, we're saying our SIP traffic is prioritized. So I don't know if you can read under automation device that last bullet point, but basically it optimizes the queue management for SIP traffic. And if you have a phone in there, you wanna make sure the phone part communication is optimized. And so you wanna make sure that the data that's coming in is correct and optimized for what you're trying to do. And in most non-industrial switches, the priority is typically gonna be phone and video. Those are the typical high priority tasks. You want a very clear phone call. 
So voice over IP is a very, very important and high priority communication until you're out on the plant floor, then you don't want to uh, shut the machine down because somebody's getting a very clear phone call. You'd rather have a bad phone call and keep the line running. So that's why it's very important to use these because without turning these on or using none, it doesn't know necessarily how to organize and optimize the traffic coming through. So basically everything is of the same priority uh, using a default setting. And so one of the last things that we want to talk about is going to be VLAN management, where you can go in and set and associate. You can create the, the VLANs that you want to use on your system and associate the different ports to them. So it's important to go through and set that up if you're going to be doing any VLAN management, VLAN association, or breaking your plant into different network, into different networks. So, and this is where you typically do that. Uh, you can also take any unused ports and put them on a VLAN that doesn't go anywhere. That's another fun little security hack that a lot of people do. Uh, it also gets a little annoying when you actually try to connect to it and want to do some configuration. So you need to manage that appropriately and make sure everybody's on the, uh, on the same page when it comes to security and what functionalities you're going to use to implement security across your system. And I believe this was a very short one today. Is that is all I have. So I'm open for questions. I've opened it up to the other panelists to see if I missed anything. Looks like you did a good job, Joe. No questions. All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, uh, thank you for your time and we'll uh, see you on the next one.